So I'm going to um, switch up versions on you guys. I'm going to teach from this uh, uh, fancy Bible I got here, the Charles Spurgeon Study Bible. It's kind of a little treasure. And uh, it has a little bit different translation. So, uh, But you'll be able to follow along just fine in your uh, New King James or whatever you might have there on your lap. So we're going to continue in chapter 19 with our story. Uh, We saw that uh, last week we had this awesome experience of Mount Karma and all the power and the the exhibition of God's greatness, basically, to do what could not be done. You know, the neat thing about God is that He is God over all of nature, and He uses nature uh, many, many times to accomplish His purposes. However, tonight, we're going to find a little bit different take on it. We saw this great exhibition of power when the fire came down, and it licked up the water and the sacrifice and the dirt and everything else, and the people came to realize that uh, truly uh, Yahweh is God. He is the Lord. So we saw that uh, Elijah seized all the prophets of Baal, Baal, however you want to say that. Now, for some reason, it doesn't appear in our text that uh, our, our little friend Jezebel, our little witch, friend here, was present at Mount Carmel, because when we get to chapter 19, in the first verse, we read that Ahab, who was the king, who was her husband, told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So maybe she was home cooking, or cleaning house, or doing something else. No, I doubt it. Um, Very, very wicked woman. Why we don't find her at the mountain, I don't know. Maybe she knew inside what was going to happen, perhaps. But Jezebel sent the messenger to Elijah, saying, May the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. You want to kill my prophets? Well, I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. So Elijah became afraid. Our mighty man of God, who has done so many awesome things so far as we have been studying about him, our mighty man of God has become afraid of this woman Jezebel. And immediately he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there, but he went on a day's journey in the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And then he laid down and he slept under the broom tree. Amazing, isn't it? Here, here we have Elijah running for his life, leaves his servant behind. Talk about serious depression and fear. He's hiding under a tree, and he's asking God to kill him. Now, I don't know really for the life of me, perhaps he's asking God to kill him because he doesn't want Jezebel to do it. Perhaps he doesn't want to die by an infidel's hand, maybe. Or maybe he's just, like he said here, I've had enough. Have you ever had enough? You ever felt like that in your life? You just go out and you tell God, I've had enough of this. I can't take it anymore. I just want to lay down under my little broom tree and give up the ghost and be done with it, right? And God is saying, nope, you're not getting out of here that easy. (laughs) I hear a lot of times brothers and sisters will say, man, I can't wait to get out of this crummy world and get to heaven. 
Well, I can agree with you there. But you know what? God's got a purpose for you and me. We're not just here sucking air. He's got a calling on our lives. And, you know, should we choose to accept that calling, then we will find true fulfillment. Will we always do everything perfect? No. I have pondered the idea of why God's Word includes all the failures of these great men throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Look at David. I mean, my goodness, he made bunches of mistakes, didn't he? And, and of course, we hold David in very high esteem, you know, as the, the, you know, the great, great, great grandfather of Jesus, if you will, the one who establishes the throne forever and ever. Um, but yet, yeah, David made a lot of mistakes. Elijah, he'd been doing pretty good up until this time. As a matter of fact, his, his uh, uh, performance at the mountain, taking care of all these false prophets, absolutely a pinnacle in his career, I guess you would say. But now, after all of that great success, he falls on his face and fails. Is there people in your life that you look up to, Christians, and you think, oh man, I, I wish I could be like them, right? I wish I could be as together as them. Well, let me tell you something, they're not together either. We all make mistakes no matter how great we think we are, don't we? We all sometimes leave home and we forget a part of the armor. It might be the helmet that we forget of salvation, you know. How important is that? To cover my brain, to influence my thoughts, the helmet of salvation. I walk out the door without it and I step out into the world. Wow, I could be in big trouble. Because now my mind is open to all different kinds of attack, depression, and ultimately, failure. So our friend is very, very bummed. He's very scared, it tells us. He became afraid. But suddenly, an angel touches him. And the angel told him, get up and eat. And then he looked, and there at his head was a loaf of bread baked over hot stones and a jug of water. I wonder if he called for takeout or something. What the heck? Where did it come from? The angel must have prepared it for him while he was taking his little nap. And a jug of water was there. So he ate and he drank and he laid down again. And the angel of the Lord returned for a second time and touched him. And he said, get up and eat. Or the journey will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and he drank. And then on the strength from that, flood, that food, he walked for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, to the mountain of God. And he entered a cave there and he spent the night. So just for general information... Um, this event with uh, Jezebel, uh, Elijah finds himself in the most northern part of uh, Israel. And he wants to flee from her, so he heads south. It's a 40-day journey on foot. And he hikes all the way down to the very, very southern border of um, Israel. He even kind of goes beyond the border because he goes in the Negev area, which is a wilderness of nothingness. But he goes to the mountain of God and finds a small cave there. And he goes into the cave and he hides out. So suddenly the word of the Lord came to him and he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied and he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of armies. But the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left, and they're looking for me to take my life. Woe is me. I'm all alone. And then he said, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. At that moment, the Lord passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. 
After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper, or maybe a small, still voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him, and he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Deja vu. Verse 14 I've been very zealous for the Lord God of armies, he replied. But the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they're looking for me to take my life. So nothing has really changed, right, Elijah? I've shown you all of these great things. I spoke to you in a soft voice. And when I'm asking you what you're doing here, you should be saying, I'm waiting on my next assignment, Dad. I'm waiting for you to send me back out on the battlefield. But no, Elijah spouts the very parrots, the very same words that he said earlier before God spoke to him. Now, we did see fire from heaven. We have seen great and mighty wind where God was in the wind. We've seen storms. We've seen earthquakes. And God used each and every one of these natural forces to accomplish his will. And whatever that might have been at that moment. You know, you might remember when the children of Israel were worshiping the, the calf. And Moses come down with the Ten Commandments. He said, whoever's for the Lord, stand on this side. And whoever's for the cow, stand on that side. And what happened? The earth opened up, didn't it? And it swallowed all of those people. He used an earthquake. Violent. He uses earthquakes. He uses fire. He uses wind. But you know what? He also speaks in a small, still, soft whisper. You have to listen for it, you guys. Too many times we're looking for the earthquake. We're waiting for the wind. And the fire of purification or however we want to look at it. And, and God's just saying, just sit quietly. I want to talk to you. I want to have a moment with you. Quiet moment. So important for us to have those moments with the Lord. So verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go and return by the way you came to the wilderness of Damascus. Go back where you came from. Wait a minute, I just walked for 40 days to get here. What was the whole deal behind that? Well, first of all, he was running away out of fear. And now that God has spoken to him, he's sending him back. I'm not done with you yet, Elijah. You have work to do. And I realize that you're just a man, and you make all kinds of mistakes, and we all do, but I'm not done with you. You know, I've been in ministry for close to 20 years. I've made a lot of mistakes. A lot of times I've thought to myself, that's it. I'm going to go flip hamburgers. I'll go back to floor covering or something, you know. And God's like, nope, it's not going to happen. Quit your pouting. I got my hand on you. And you're not going to get out of it that easy. It's a battle. We're in a war. We're in a spiritual war. He's given us equipment. He's given us his spirit. He's given us his word. He's given us everything we need, the Bible says in the New Testament, to live godly lives in Christ Jesus. You have everything you need right now. You're not lacking anything. You got a whole tool chest full of things that God's provided for us to do battle. But man, I'm telling you, if you don't open the drawers and start pulling tools out and using them, you can have all the tool chests in the world and it won't help at all until you start using them, right? 
You know, I heard this guy telling a story about, well, I'm a mechanic, and I'm just praying God will get me some work, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to sit here on my couch and watch TV all day long, wait for that knock at the door for somebody to tell me I got a beautiful job for you, big money. No, it's not going to happen. Well, I could even deliver a rollaway full of tools, and I'll put a broken car in the garage for you to fix. But if you don't get off the couch, if you don't get your eyes out of the world and get back in that garage and get to work, everything that God has put out there for you and me as a tool, it becomes meaningless. Each and every one of us has access to the same. It's all about whether or not we're choosing today to use those tools or to just be depressed and sit on the couch and watch as the world turns or whatever. So the Lord told him to go back. And when you arrive, you are to anoint Hazael as king over Aram, or Aram. You are to anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Saphat, from Abel Meholah, as prophet in your place. So now he's learning he has a successor. Retirement seems to be right on the horizon for Elijah. So he sends him back. And then he says in verse 17, Then Jehu will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Heziel. And Elisha will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Jehu. So I think we got war on the horizon here. We got some battles that are coming up. He says, but I will leave 7,000 in Israel. Every knee that has not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So Elijah left there and he found Elisha, son of Saphet, or Saphet, as he was plowing. Now this is a pretty cool picture in your mind. There were 12 teams of oxen in front of him. And he was with the 12th team. Elijah walked by him, and he threw his mantle over him. So Elisha left the oxen and ran to follow Elijah. He said, please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. Does that sound familiar? For maybe a story that Jesus told, right? People come up with all kinds of excuses. Let me go bury my dead dad. He's only 30 years old. He'll die in 30 years. But let me go bury him when he's dead, and then I'll, I'll come and follow you after that. Let me go kiss my father and mother, and then I'll follow you. He said, go on back, he replied, for what have I done to you? So he turned back from following him, and he took the team of oxen, and he slaughtered them. With the oxen's wooden yoke and the plow, he cooked the meat, and gave it to the people, and they ate. And then he left and followed Elijah and served him. So here you have this man with 12 teams of oxen. And here we have that magic number again, 12. Possibly a picture of representation of the 12 tribes. Um, and we find that he is plowing with these 12 oxen. That's a pretty powerful plow. But as Elijah's walking by, he takes his mantle or his little thing he had draped over him and he throws it on there and it lands on Elisha, which he knows right away means he's commissioning me, he's calling me. My life is just about to change dramatically, <laughs> but I still need to go home and say goodbye to my family, and kiss my mom and my dad goodbye. Is he a grown man, or is he a little child? That's an interesting thing, right? But he turned back, he took his oxen, and he slaughtered them. He took his plow, the yoke, everything that was made out of wood, and he made a fire with it, and he cooked all these oxen, on the fire, and then gave it all away 
to his people. You know, it would seem that what he was doing here was he was making a clean cut from his formal life, wasn't he? You're no longer going to be plowing fields for corn. You're going to be plowing fields for Almighty God now. And just to make sure that you don't turn around and come back and do it, you're going to burn all your tools, too, that you would use, your implements, your equipment. And so now that this is done, he really has nothing. He's literally forsaken everything. Goodbye, mom and dad. Goodbye, oxen. Goodbye, trade. Goodbye, farm. I'm never returning this way again. Now, King Ben-Hadad of Aram assembled his entire army. Thirty-two kings, along with horses and chariots, were with him. He marched up and besieged Samaria and fought against it. And he sent messengers into the city to King Ahab of Israel and said to him, This is what Ben-Hadad says. Your silver and your gold are mine, and your best wives and children are mine as well. And the king of Israel answered, Just as you say, my lord the king, I am yours with all that I have. How weak can you get, right? This guy's a king. Not only has he been panty whipped by his wife, he can't stand up to his enemies either. We know who wore the pants in that family. It was his wife, Jezebel. And he was afraid of her too. So this guy comes down and he says, this is what I want. I want your gold, I want your silver, I want your women, I want your children. It's mine. I am the enemy. They call me Satan. And I'm coming for your stuff. I'm going to take everything you have as a spoil, including your relationship with God. So the king of Israel said, all right, Lord, the king, whatever you want, I'm yours. The messengers returned and they said, this is what Ben-Hadad says. So now they're coming back for more. I've sent messengers to you saying that you are to give me your silver, your gold, your wives, and your children. But at this time tomorrow, I will send my servants to you. And they will search your palace and your servants' houses. And they will lay their hands on and take whatever is precious to you. And then the king of Israel called for the elders of the land and said, Recognize that this one is only looking for trouble. For he's demanding my wives and my children and my silver and my gold. And I didn't turn him down. And all the elders and all the people said to him, don't listen or agree. And so he said to Ben-Hadad's messengers, say to my lord the king, everything you demanded of your servant the first time, I will do. But this thing I cannot do. So the messengers left and they took word back to him. What's he saying to the king Ben-Hadad? You can have my wives, you can have my children, my gold, my silver, but you can't have my personal stuff because it's really still all about me. And I don't want you taking my stuff, going into my house and taking whatever you see fit. No, 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 I'm not going to let that happen. It's gone far enough. So Ben-Hadad, oh, and by the way, Ben-Hadad is the name of, I think, if I'm not wrong, seven kings throughout history. They all had the same name, Ben-Hadad. Good question. Why? I'm not sure. But just a footnote for us. So when Ben-Hadad uh, heard this response, while he and the kings were drinking in their quarters, he said to his servants, take your positions. And so they took their positions against the city. A prophet approached King Ahab of Israel and said, This is what the Lord says. Do you see this whole huge army? Watch, I am handing it over to you today so that you may know 
that I am the Lord. You know, Ahab was a real loser as a king. Terrible leader. Ready to forfeit all of the goods to this Ben-Hadab. But this prophet comes along and says, Watch what I'm going to do, King Ahab. You're not worthy to see this happen, but I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it because those people have disrespected me. Those people have spread a rumor that the God of Israel only lives in the hill country. He's not in charge of the weather. He's not in charge of the crops. He's not in charge of very much. He is low. He is Uh, relegated to a a geographical area, and if we attack them outside that area, then our gods will win. And that upsets the Lord. You know, the Bible says God is a jealous God. He doesn't like people saying that they're bigger and badder than him, or more powerful than him. And every time they do that, he proves them wrong. He did it in Egypt. He did it over and over again, we see in Scripture. And now here, the prophet is telling the king Ahab, God's going to snuff these people out right in front of you because they blasphemed Jehovah or Yahweh. So the prophet, uh, Ahab asked the prophet, by whom? In other words, by whom's hand is this going to happen? And the prophet said, this is what the Lord says. By the young men of the prophets and the leaders. And then he said, well, who's going to start the battle? And he said, you. You, King Ahab, you're going to start the battle. You know, there comes a point where you've got to stand up and fight back. There comes a point where you just can't be stepped on anymore. So Ahab mobilized the young men of the provincial leaders. There were 232. After them, he mobilized all of the Israelite troops, 7,000, not very many. And they marched out at noon, while Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings who were helping him were getting drunk in their quarters. They're having a party in their little hideout quarter. And the young men of the provincial leaders marched out first, the prophets-to-be, the prophets and priests in training, they marched out first. That's significant. Then Ben-Hadad sent out scouts, and they reported to him, saying, men are marching out of Samaria. You know, it's interesting when we see these characters in the Bible, we, and we fit, as I mentioned earlier, we don't always perform what we think we will. It's easy to talk. I'm never going to turn my back on God again. I'll never doubt Him again as long as I live. And then Jezebel opens her mouth and we run for the hills. We don't always perform what we think we will, nor do we ever always, I should say, do we always reach where we hope to arrive. What's your destination? Well, we don't always reach our destination, do we? Failures in our lives can be as numerous as success, and even the most successful people fail. We should trust God and distrust ourselves. Very important point. So verse 18, he says, If they have marched out in peace, take them alive. And if they have marched out for battle, take them alive. We're just going to scoop all these guys up. And 
We'll take them with us. They'll become assimilated into our people. And the young men of the provincial leaders and the army behind them marched out from the city. And each one struck down his opponent. So the Armenians fled. And Israel pursued them. But King Ben-Hadad of Aram escaped on a horse with the cavalry. And the king of Israel marched out and attacked the cavalry and the chariots, and he inflicted a severe slaughter on Aram. And then the prophet approached the king of Israel and said to him, Go and strengthen yourself, and then consider carefully what you should do. For in the spring, the king of Aram will attack you. So he's giving him a little bit of a clue here. You've had a great victory here. You know God brought about this victory. And now I want you to go back and make yourself strong. Strengthen yourself. Not only maybe physically, but how about mentally and spiritually too? So that you're all around, you're ready for battle. Because it won't be long in the spring He's going to come back after you. He escaped with the cavalry. He was never killed. Now he's going to go back and he's going to plot and plan. And then he'll be back. Now the king of Aram's servants said to him. There's a point I made earlier. Their gods, speaking of Israel, are gods of the hill country. That's why they were stronger than we were. Instead, we should fight with them in the plains. Then, they will, then we will certainly be stronger than they are. Oh, trying to put God in a box. Trying to put him in a geographical place. The creator of the universe. So easy to try to put God in a box. To try to say this is how he'll do it. But you never know. God's going to do what he wants to do. But these people had so many, as I mentioned a couple weeks in a row now, they had so many Baals, they had one for everything. You know, they had the Baal fertility and the harvest and the rain and the sunshine and battle and all different types of Baal gods. And they're thinking, well, we got this Baal God that lives in the plains. That's where our strength is. We only lost because their God's a mountain God. His power is in the mountains. Well, let's attack them in the plains where their God isn't present. How naive to think for one second, after everything they've seen throughout history... Remember, history is not hidden from these people. They know the stories too. They know about Egypt. They know about the 40 years. They know about the sea opening up for these people. They know all those things. But history has a way of degrading over years. And I think we kind of lose the impact of some of the events that we should hold on to as far as memory goes. So, we're going to fight and be stronger than they are. Verse 24, also do this. Remove each king from his position and appoint captains in their place. Raise another army for yourself like the army you lost. Horse for horse, chariot for chariot. And let's fight with them on the plain. And we will certainly be stronger than they are. Great counsel. And the king listened to them and did it. Careful who you get your counsel from, folks. So in the spring, Ben-Hadad mobilized the Armenians and he went up to Aphek to battle Israel once again. The Israelites mobilized, gathered supplies, and went to fight them. 
the Israelites camped in front of them like two little flocks of goats. I love that. While the Armenians filled the landscape. And then the man of God approached and he said to the king of Israel, this is what the Lord says. Because the Armenians have said the Lord is a God of the mountains and not of the valleys, I will hand over all of this whole huge army to you. And then you will know that I am the Lord. They camped opposite of each other for seven days. <clears throat> kind of reminds me of the standoff with the Philistines and Goliath. And <clears throat> they're both camped on either side of the valley and they're shouting stuff at each other. Our God's stronger than your God and your God's not strong. And they're just sitting there having verbal, you know, yelling, trying to imitate, uh, intimidate one another. These guys are doing the same thing. They're camped in opposite, you know, facing each other for seven days. They could see the enemy right over there. On the seventh day, the battle took place. And the Israelites struck down the Armenians. 100,000 foot soldiers in one day. The ones who remained fled to the city of Aphek. And the wall fell on those 27,000 remaining men. So they must have all went to the city where they had a big fortified wall and they were huddling around it and the Lord knocked it down on them. And crushed them all. The wall came tumbling down once again. God proving that not only can he do great things, but he can knock down walls. He can gain victories that we could only imagine. He can gain victories in our lives that we could only imagine. And he can knock down those walls. It's easy, perhaps, to think that you can be secure behind a wall that you've built. Whatever that wall might be. Could be unforgiveness. <clears throat> could be the wall of jealousy, a wall of addictions and rebellion, all these different kinds of walls we build. And it blocks us, we, you know, from God. Whereas we think we're huddling down in there and we're okay. And God is saying, no, I'm going to knock that wall down. You're, you're, what you think is security is going to crumble. What you think is something that's immovable I'm going to move it. And you're going to be broken. And however God chooses to break, humble, whatever, however word you want to use it, that's part of the process. If I'm not broken, I'm going to keep building walls. If I'm not broken, I'm going to keep trying to do it my way. But God's coming in and saying, no, you guys have built these walls, and I'm going to knock them down. 27,000 men died. So Ben-Hadad also fled, and he went into an inner room in the city. His servant said to him, consider this. We have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. So let's put sackcloth around our waists and ropes around our heads. And let's go out to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare your life. So they dressed up with sackcloth around their waists and ropes around their heads. They went to the king of Israel and they said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, Please spare my life. Oh, Oh, Benny's singing a new song now, isn't he? First it was, I'm taking everything you got. And now it's, please spare my life. So he asked these messengers, is he still alive? 
He is my brother. Well, yeah, do a little bit of inbreeding and stuff. I guess he could have probably said that they had each other's blood. He's my brother. And now the men are looking for a sign of hope. And so they quickly picked up on this and responded, Yes, it is your brother, Ben-Hadad. And then he said, Go and bring him. So Ben-Hadad came out to him, and Ahab had him come up into the chariot. Ben-Hadad said to him, I restore to you the cities that my father took from your father. And you may set up marketplaces for yourself in Damascus. Like my father set up in Samaria. We're going to be friends again. We're going to be family. Everything's going to be great. As a matter of fact, we're going to make a compromise with one another. You're going to bring your people and I'll bring my people and we'll blend them all together. It'll be a great thing. I can just see God shaking his head going, are you kidding me? Your brother? Really? He's not your brother, he's your enemy. So Ahab responded and he said, on the basis of this treaty, I release you. So he made a treaty with him and released him. One of the, one of the bigger mistakes of his life. You're to kill the enemy. You're not to befriend them. You're to destroy them utterly. When God says clean house, he means clean the whole house. We have enemies. Enemies that would like to come and destroy our relationship with God. So, one of the sons of the prophets came and he said to his fellow prophet, by the word of the Lord, strike me. But the man refused to strike him. And so he told him, because you did not listen to the Lord, mark my words, when you leave me, a lion will kill you. And when he left him, a lion attacked and killed him. So this prophet is going up to this other little prophet and saying, whack me with your club, cut me with your sword, injure me, hurt me. And he's going, I'm not going to do that. And he winds up being lunch for a lion. And so the prophet found another man. <laughs> and he said to him, strike me. And so the man struck him. Inflicting a wound. When the prophet went and waited for the king on the road, he disguised himself with a bandage over his eyes. And as the king was passing by, he cried out to the king. He said, your servant marched out into battle, in the middle of the battle. Suddenly a man turned aside and brought someone to me and said, guard this man. If he's ever missing, it will be your life in place of his. Or you will weigh out 75 pounds of silver. But while your servant was busy here and there, he disappeared. So I found myself kind of distracted, and the fellow just kind of disappeared. And the king of Israel said, that will be your sentence. You yourself have decided it. So he quickly removed the bandage from his eyes. The king of Israel recognized that he was one of the prophets. The prophet said to him, this is what the Lord said. Because you released from your hands the man I had set apart for destruction, it will be your life in place of his life and your people in place of his people. And the king of Israel left for home resentful and angry and entered Samaria. Once again, much like Saul, 
Saul was told to destroy all of it, wasn't he? You know, when we see that, we think, <clears throat> that's kind of harsh. Everything? The women, the children, the old people, the cattle and the sheep destroy it? Everything? And of course, Saul, he looked at that and said, that's kind of a waste. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I could utilize here. I get some of these strong men, get some of these pretty gals, some of the booty, bring it on home. You know, and I know Samuel wanted me to kill them all off, but I probably know better than God, so I'm going to spare. And he actually spared the king. And unfortunately, it was the king of those very same people that took Saul's life in the end. He did not destroy the works of the enemy. He compromised. This king's doing the same thing. And God's telling him, this is going to come back around and haunt you. It's going to come back to your home because you were disobedient. You either need to kill the evil or the evil is going to kill you. What's it going to be? Well, sheesh. It's a lot easier to just make a treaty, especially when I got my enemy under my thumb and he knows it. You know, like this king, Ben-Hadad, he's like, I'm in big trouble now, I need to be friends. Well, you got to figure old Ahab here, you know, he's been married to Jezebel. Probably doesn't have very much godly insight to things. And he just kind of makes the wrong choices once again. And once again, we find that there's a heavy price to pay. Now, we're faced with making choices every day. Some of them are important, some of them not. But you know, I'm of the mind that I would say, Lord, direct our paths and give us wisdom. And when we make choices... We want to run it by you first. Does it get the stamp of approval on your desk? Because if it doesn't, I'm not going to bother. Because I want to be in your will. Because I can see by these scriptures that we're studying that, man, if I get out of your will, the consequences can be pretty costly. A whole nation can be destroyed over bad choices. By not listening to God. Kind of like the nation we're living in. They're not listening to God. They don't care about God. They don't want anything to do with God. And you think God has closed his eyes or turned his back or he's on vacation or he's busy doing something else? No. He's watching. And I know many times we pray, Lord, wipe them out. But you know, there may be several thousand of them out there that are going to come to know the Lord. And in his great patience and his great mercy, he waits. He waits until that cup is filled and overflowing. And once it starts overflowing, there's no turning back. So, let's make good choices today, folks. Let's go home and make good choices this week. Right? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for these stories. And Lord, I know there's a lot more that we could glean from these, Lord, but just to try to get the basics, the milk, Lord, that we could have that discernment in our lives because we know that you're the God that doesn't change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we're the humans that don't change either. We're still the same. And without you, Lord, we're lost. Without you, Lord, we're in rebellion. We're making poor choices. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving us, for accepting us as your people. Help us to bring glory to your name, Lord, and forgive us of our foolishness. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.